Lord Jesus, you are our heart's desire. We love you so much that when you uh, inspire us with the moments of worship like this, uh, we are transcended and uh, we cannot contain the kind of uh, joy that exists in our hearts just knowing that you care so deeply for us and love us so much. Holy Spirit of the living God, you are given to us to guide us and to lead us and to empower us, but mostly to remind us and to show us how much Jesus loves us. And so we come here today, Lord, and uh, we are trembling as we stand in the presence of God and we consider it the most awesome privilege in the world that you would count us as your children. You are truly awesome and wonderful. And I wish I had better words to say than those. <laughs> Today, Lord, we want even the rocks to cry out how much we love you and how awesome and great it is to have the God of all creation that would even give us a second look. But you have given us mercy and forgiven us and given us a second chance and renewed us. And I am so just thankful. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you so much, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, we'll try to pull it together here. What a great day to be coming to church, huh? What a great day to be a church. Maybe we need it. Maybe we need to stand up and say, thank God you're here one more time. You know, thank God you're here. Really good to have you here today. Wonderful to have you here. Go ahead. You don't have to be shy. <laughs> great to have you here. Great, great to have you here, brother. I'm glad you're not in a hospital. You guys are just way too friendly. <laughs> Don't be sorry. You know, I like the scripture that tells us that they will know we are his true disciples by the love that we share for each other. And, uh, you know, I, Laban, where's Dr. Laban? There he is. Wait, always sits in the back. But, you know, we're working on a sermon series that's going to start in October. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the contributions that LeBan had, uh, one of the many, 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 many contributions that he had uh, was, was the one of, uh, you know, he just likes spending time in fellowship with other believers. <coughs> and he, uh, he was adamant on that fact. And... Uh, it really struck me, you know, how, um, you know, when, when Christians get together, like when Dave, Kenny, and I get together in a restaurant, it's almost embarrassing because we go there for breakfast and they end up serving us lunch, you know, and when the books are spread out all over the tables and stuff. But, you know, it, it, time just, just flies when you're spending time in the Word with believers or even in our home group. And, oh, gee, time to go home, you know. And nobody really wants to go home, <clears throat> It is just, it, it is wonderful. It is truly wonderful 
uh, spending time with people who, communitists. Do you remember we had the sermon on communitists? The people who are joined together by a mutual vision. When we go to Bethlehem Chapel, it's just like that, you know. It's like kind of like going home, you know. And uh, uh, it's very exciting. We're so glad to have you here. You're so welcome here. Anyhow. We are uh, proceeding through the book of Ephesians, and we're going to take a bit of a turn today. <coughs> uh, the sermon that I will be delivering today will not be exactly as prepared, so I'm going to ask our, our folks on the screen to kind of keep up to me if you can, and I know you're pretty good at that. So, But our main text today, if you don't have a Bible, please put your hand up. We have lots of Bibles, by the way. If you need a Bible... If you would like a Bible, you can keep this Bible. This is your Bible. We won't arrest you if you're trying to sneak out the door with it or anything. You know, it's yours to keep. So if anybody needs a Bible, just put your hand up. And Over here, we got one. Any more? Don't, don't be embarrassed because if you, you, we, wanna, we want you to, we, we just, we're glad to give them away, you know. That's, that's the whole point of having them. Over here? One over here? Okay. You know, and mark it up, too. Like, you know, get a pen, mark it up. It's, it's yours to keep. Um, are we good? Okay. So we have, we're, we have a, a short text we're going to use today. Uh, it's out of Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, I'm going to read this. It's starting at verse 15. So be careful how you live. Not as fools, but as those who are wise. Can I, I'm going to repeat that. So be careful how you live, not as fools, but as those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but try to understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, let the Holy Spirit control you. Don't, don't let wine control you, but let the Holy Spirit control you. It's about intoxication. Don't allow wine to intoxicate you. Rather, allow the Holy Spirit to intoxicate you. Then you will sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts, and you will always give thanks for everything to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last year, some of us read a book called The Christian Atheist. And, and if you remember, the theme of the book was that many Christians live their entire Christian experience without ever really engaging the world for God and and. And the theme is that some people uh, can kind of live their whole Christian experience and nobody really knows any difference. Like you might, you know, you sit in a crowd and you just look like everyone else, you behave like everyone else, and, and no one can tell the difference. And, and that was the theme of the book. And, and it was quite a powerful book. I remember in the book, there was the one scene where there was a, um, a, a, a train, like a, uh, a, a transit train, in, in a, like an L train in the town, and there were a bunch of pastors, and there was this one young man who uh, could hear these pastors talking about their, you know, their faith, they were coming back from some conference or something, and, and this, the Gresham, the guy who wrote the book, he was one of the pastors, and the young man turned to him and said, hey, you know, I've been kind of wondering about this whole Christian thing, I'm kind of, ex you know, looking around, shopping around, you know, for, for God. And, and maybe, maybe you can tell me something about, about this Jesus that you guys have been talking about. And the pastors all kind of looked at this themselves, and I guess the Grisham, they kind of said, okay, well, you're our spokesperson here. And you know, he had a hard time sharing his faith. He just couldn't seem to put it into words. And he'd been a pastor for many years. And, you know, and it's, if you, it's a good book. We have it in the library. In fact, we have two copies in the library. So you really, you, you might want to sign it out. And we have the video series. So if you're interested, it's a great book. We have a great library. It's a, uh, it's a 
plug for our library. But he said he went through his um, seminary education. He thought about the four spiritual laws. He thought about everything, and the words just kind of fumbled out of his mouth. And I guess the train had gone through a couple of stops, you know, and finally the young man, you know, I guess it was his stop, and, and he got up, and he walked over to the door, and uh, he said, uh, well, thanks for trying. Door opens, walks out, doors close. seems difficult sometimes to engage the Christian experience in our lives. Because there's so many other distractions. So be careful how you live. Not as fools, but as those who are wise. For those who know Jesus. Make the most of every opportunity for doing good because the days are evil. These are bad days we live in. Don't act thoughtlessly, but try to understand what the Lord really wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Those are distractions. Instead, let the Holy Spirit fill and control you. Allow the Holy Spirit to intoxicate you, to control your thoughts and actions, to guide you. Then you will sing spiritual psalms and hymns, among yourselves, making music to the Lord, and you will always give thanks for everyone to God the Father in our Lord, name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In another book called The Sacred Romance, you can read this. Can it possibly get any more uncertain than this? We so long for life to be better than this we wish the beauty and the love and the adventure would stay and that some, someone strong and kind would show us how to take the arrows, the pain away. We hope that God will be our hero. Of all the people in the universe, he could stop the arrows and arrange for just a little bit more blessing in our lives. He can spin the earth change the weather, topple governments, obliterate armies, and resurrect the dead. Is it too much to ask that he intervene in our story? Is it too much to ask that he somehow bless us? But he often seems aloof, almost indifferent to our plight, so entirely out of our control. Would it be any worse if there was no God? If, we, if he didn't exist, at least we wouldn't get our hopes up. We could settle once and for all that we really are alone in the universe and get on with surviving the best way, get on with making the best out of what we have. This is, in fact, how many professing Christians end up living as practical agnostics. Perhaps God will come through. Perhaps he won't. So I'll be hanged as if I live, as if uh, I'll be hanged if I'll live as though he had to come through. I'll hedge my bets just in case he doesn't. The simple word for this is godlessness. Like a lover who's been wronged, we guard our heart against future disappointment. So on one hand, we have the Christian atheist where they can't tell us apart. And the other one, a little more subtle, the Christian agnostic. Agnostics would say, yeah, there could be a God, maybe. But I'm not necessarily going to pin my hopes on him just in case he doesn't come through. You know, I, I read... Oh, it was a radio show in, uh, when we lived in the States. Uh, I think it was, might have been Focus on the Family, where they had taken some survey about the most popular Christian verse. And it was, God helps those who help themselves. Do you know this verse? <laughs> it 
this is what they did. They really did the survey. And so just a man on the street, no, oh, yeah, God helps those who help themselves. You've heard that, haven't you? That's in uh, Third Enoch, right? <laughs> you know, I understand Christian atheism on one level. There's a lot of pressures uh, to adapt and to live in the world. And, you know, I, like I don't have a, a regular job anymore. I am a pastor, but my wife has a regular job. And, and I know how hard it is for her to share her faith at work, but she manages to do it. Secretly, she prays for people. That's one thing. But a Christian agnostic, there's a choice. You're, you're making a decision to say, you know, I'm going to pray to God. Uh, we'll see what happens. It, it might work out. It might not work out. But at the end of the day, I'm going to hedge my bet. I'm going to make sure that my ducks are in a row. So just in case God doesn't come through, I'll be okay. Now, I asked if we could share this story. So I'm going to share this story. And again, Dr. LeBan, I mean, he said, when we preach, we must share our stories. Uh, we don't want to be talking down to people or making them feel like they're not part of the engagement. So I'm sharing a story from Bethlehem Church. When we preached the, the story, the sermon on forgiveness, do you, do you remember that? That was a few, a few weeks ago. One of the parts of the sermon was when we store profanity in our hearts. And that's bitterness, unforgiveness, rage, anger. But in this case, it was unforgiveness. And profanity, the definition is, is treating something unholy that is really holy. That's profanity. That's a literal definition. So if you have received Jesus as your Savior, Christ is in your heart. He's living in you, living in your, in your body. It's no longer me that lives, but Christ that lives in me. If you're engaging in, say, unforgiveness, you're actually engaging in profanity. You're, 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 because Christ is holy, and he's all about what? He's all about restoration, forgiveness. So, we preach this, this same sermon that we had here. 2.30 in the afternoon, we show up there, and the team is there. I think we had uh, Mr. Kenny. Were you there that day? Yeah. And uh, Shane was there, and, and Kevin was there. And uh, it's a great, boy, it's great fun. Are these guys invited to come to your church at 2.30? Anytime. Boy, you know, it's, the, it's great fun. They're very emotive. Is that, would that be a good, good word? Very emotive. But, you know, we preached the same sermon. And, uh, and we talked about how unforgiveness in your, in your soul will erode you away. And if you're harmed by someone, you, the harm continues to loop and you're more harmed. The memories harm you. So what Jesus says is to bless those who, who persecute you. Pray for those who mistreat you. That's the message that he plants deep in our heart. Why? Because he's taken up residence in us. It's not that complicated to figure out, right? We, it's no longer we that lives, but Christ that lives in us. Well, we preach the same sermon. And, and wow, at the end of the service, it's like a bomb went off. You remember that? It's like a bomb went off. A, 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 a lady comes up, and as I recall, she could barely talk. She was like, oh, 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 you know how that is? You know, you're, you're grasping for air. And she stands in front of the whole church and says, I didn't want to come to church today. I did not want to, I did not want to be here today because I'm so mad at God. And I'm mad at you because you love God. I'm, I'm just mad at everyone. I didn't want to be here today. She said, do you know that I became a Christian when I was 17, I think she said. And nothing's worked out. Nothing's worked out. My whole life is nothing's worked out. So I, don't, I just don't want to do it anymore, she said. But, and and my, my kids have joined a gang. And I'm in poverty, and my life is just crummy. 
And I didn't want to come to church today. Except that my uh, little five-year-old granddaughter wanted to come. And she said, Grandma, I really want to go to church today. Bethlehem Church, that's her church. I really want to be there today. And then she said, you know, last week, um, my granddaughter was sexually assaulted. And I was so mad. so angry at him that he would let this happen. And she wanted to come to church. And I realized that I was storing her family in my heart. And I'm so sorry, Jenny. And she said, God, will you forgive me? And then she asked the church to forgive her. So the guys went up and they had the oil and they anointed her with oil and they prayed over her. And the church forgave her. There's no way to hedge your bets when all your support mechanisms have been removed, when you're already poor and you're already assaulted and you're already harmed. The Apostle Paul, when he spoke to the church in Ephesus, he didn't want them to go back to their old sin patterns. He didn't want them to go back, to, you know, to, to finding other answers to life's problems other than God, other than Jesus Christ. And he knew that they would have a tendency to do that. You remember, they used to go and, and actually purchase spells and incantations. That's... That's what they did in Ephesus. Or they would go to the temple of Diana and offer a sacrifice, some other god. But he said, I don't want you to be like Christian atheists so that no one can tell the difference. But more importantly, I don't want you to be like Christian agnostics. I don't want you to think that maybe God will show up maybe if he feels like it. Or maybe if it's a good day and hedge your bets. And I don't want you to do that. Instead, I want you to be focused on the fact that, that God is for you. So be very careful how you live your life. Not as fools, but as wise. Make the most of every opportunity for doing good. Because guess what, folks? The days are evil. The days are evil. You know, when, when sin entered the world, in Gen you don't read Genesis, we, we were studying Genesis chapters 1 to 3 in our uh, sermon preparation group this week. And hey, sin entered the world, original sin. Days are evil. Make the most of every opportunity like this lady did. Instead of saying, I am so angry with God, I'm so mad at God, that I'm just going to ignore God altogether because he's never going to show up anyhow. And if he ever does, he, well, who knows? He might show up. But in this case, she was almost tempted to be unwise to remove herself from the only person that could ever help. The only help she could ever really get was Jesus Christ. The only help that she could ever get was a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. But she was so harmed and so wounded that she didn't want to come to church. And it was the actual little girl who God was speaking through the little girl. Grandma, please take me to church. You know, uh, it's, it's storing that profanity in your heart. Saying something, calling something unholy, that it's really holy. There, there are two kinds of wisdom in this world. Two kinds. And they're both spiritually motivated. One from Satan and one from God. Let me, if, let me read this to you out of James chapter 3. If you are wise and understand God's ways, 
live a life of steady goodness so that only good deeds will pour forth. And if you don't brag about the good you do, then you will be truly wise. But if you are bitterly jealous, there is selfish ambition in your hearts, don't brag about being wise. That's the worst kind of a lie. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritually, and motivated by the devil. For wherever there is jealousy, selfish ambition, there will you also find disorder and every kind of evil. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no partiality and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. We, we don't always follow these rules. We are not always peacemakers. But when we embrace the wisdom that is from Christ, that is from God, this is the kind of fruit that we will produce. It will happen even to the worst of us when we get transformed. Even in the midst of our deepest pain, like this woman who came forward at Bethlehem Church, she was angry and self-motivated. I'm sure she wanted revenge. She wanted revenge against, against the perpetrator that harmed her granddaughter, but she wanted a piece of us too. She was so angry at Christians that your God would let this happen. How dare you that your God would let this happen? I just, you know, she was so mad and she was so motivated by self interest that I just want to harm someone as much as I've been harmed. When her little girl brought her to church and we anointed her with oil and prayed over her, you could just see that stuff drop away. There's two kinds of wisdoms in, in this world. There's one kind of wisdom that is, that is motivated by the devil for self-interest to trick you, to fool you, to get you to leave and run away and move away from the very one that can help you. That's why Paul is writing this to the church in Ephesus. Don't get tricked, he's saying. You're surrounded in evil days. You know, certainly in the, in the book of Ephesus, we know that, right? There are incantations, there's spells, there's temples. It's like that here. There's all kinds of distractions and things that can move you away. No, live as wise people. Live like that woman who, who knew where to go to get help. That's what the message is. And to understand that if we read in Ephesians, we're, we're going to get to this. We haven't got to this yet, but we are going to get to this. But I wanted to just read this to you uh, out of the Amplified Version. This is an interesting version of the Bible. If you don't have one of these, you might want to pick one up because it's, uh, it's, it's an attempt at kind of a literal Greek translation. So it doesn't read all that well aloud, but it, it often carries an impact meaning. And so let, just let me read this out of Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, verse 12, for we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the despots, against the powers, against the masters, spirits, who are the rulers of this present darkness and the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly spiritual sphere. Our battle is not with flesh and blood but with the principalities and the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. So what we're saying, what the point is here, is that when this other form of wisdom comes in, it's not innocuous. It's spiritually motivated. It is demonically inspired. And the same wisdom that we get from God is this, is this, this spirit of Christ inside of us 
working Christ out through us so that we can understand what is really true, what is really holy, what is not profane. So that we can, we can engage the kind of help that we need to engage in order to really get help. And the, others, the other wisdom is trying to pull us away from that. This Christ wisdom is pulling us to it. The, the fool, the fool, don't live as fools do, but the fool says there is no God. And a, a quote, again, from the sacred romance. This is, in fact, how many professing Christians end up living as practical agnostics. Perhaps God will come through, well, perhaps he won't. So I won't be hanged if I'll live as though he had to come through. I'll hedge my bets. And if he does not show up, if he does show up, so much the better. The simple word for this is godlessness. Like a lover who has been wronged, we guard our hearts against future disappointment. How many of us have not been hurt? Even as Christians, how many of us have been hurt? And so the, the tendency is to, is to guard yourself like the woman who came uh, to Bethlehem Church. I'm going to insulate myself from God. A fool hedges their bets. A fool does not count on God showing up. A, a fool engages the world like an atheist or an agnostic. And in fact, we even reward fools in our world because they make good investments. Not that you can't make good investments as a wise person, but we hedge our bets. Rather than, you know, r rather than engaging God, like, like how... Does God ever call us to do crazy things that don't make sense? I mean, he does. I mean, some of us are called into, quote, full-time ministry, and we leave honest jobs to do it. Others are called to, you know, to, you know, to do certain kinds of ministries that don't really make sense to anyone else, but they require the kind of commitment that is wholehearted and foolish on the outside, but godly on the inside. Investing in the world is rewarded by the world because it's, 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 it's worldly wisdom. And it's kind of like a Ponzi scheme. The more you put into it, the more you hope to get out of it, but at some point it all collapses. It f all falls apart. So Paul is saying, look, whatever you do, don't live according to the rules of the world anymore. If you really want to know what's right, if you really want to, uh, to engage in God, live with God's wisdom. Ask the Spirit of God living in you to release Christ in your life so that you can really find out what God's good, perfect, and pleasing will is. Uh, Ephesians 2.10, to do those good works prepared in advance for us to do. Make, every, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Don't act thoughtlessly, but try to understand what the Lord really wants you to do. How many of us would choose to be like Jesus, if we could just take a pill. Like if we handed out some pills right now, you know, red, you know, what's it, the matrix? Red pill, blue pill. I don't remember which one was which, but let's say we handed out a pill right now, and, and you could either be a lukewarm Christian and sort of engage the world as an agnostic, and, or, or would you take a pill where you could just take the pill and you would all of a sudden have this revelation, this, 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 okay, now I get it. It all makes sense to me. I can be like Jesus. Would you take that pill? One of the guys in our Bible study asked some great questions. I, you know what? I, I just, I love these, I love these questions because they are, they are so profound. But he says to me, um, gee, I've been a Christian for a long time. Are we supposed to kind of get it right away? Because, you know, I've been a Christian like for like 
ever. And boy, I just don't get it all. The more we study, the more we read, the more we understand how deep the Father's love is for us, how this formation of transformation changes our lives every day. We become more aware of who we used to be and more moved forward to be like Christ, but there's this painful realization that I really don't get the whole picture. And he says, is it possible that I'm missing something? And the answer is yes. And if we had the pill to give you, you could take the pill, then you would get it all and you'd be fine. But it doesn't work that way. In fact, Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he says, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition. You must let go of the other wisdom. You have to... Put it to death. You have to literally say, I am not going to follow that other kind of wisdom. You have to, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition and shoulder your cross daily and follow me. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give your life for me, you will find true life. And how do you benefit if you gain the whole world and forfeit your soul in the process. What if you were able to live by the world's wisdom and get all the stuff you wanted? What if it worked out perfectly for you? And then you got hit by a bus and it was all over anyhow and you lost your soul. If a person is ashamed of my message, I, the Son of Man, will be ashamed of him. And that person, when I return for glory to the Father, and the holy angels, I assure you that some of you standing here right now will not die before you see the kingdom of God. Well, I mean, I have excitement, but. If I gave you a pill, and the same blue pill, and the same red pill, And I said to you, if you take this pill, this blue pill, it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you everything. Your, your, your life is going to change the way you look at the world is going to change. People may ridicule you. They may make fun of you. You may be harmed. But if you take the pill, you'll have eternal life. And God will be with you forever. However, you could take the other pill and live by the world's standards. Which one of you would take that pill? My wife says to me the other day, you know, uh, when we're praying at night, she, uh, in the evening, she says, uh, she said, you know, we never knew what it would cost us to be Christians. We never knew. We never, you know, when we, when we receive Christ, it all seems so great at the time. But then as life goes on, how hard it can be. But she also says it's amazing how God answers prayer. And how at every opportunity when you have a choice, you know, to choose some other way, it's never right, it never works out. But somehow God always rescues you in the nick of time and seldom early and never late. So here's the message again that Paul is saying. So be careful how you live. Make wise choices. Don't live as fools do, saying that there's no God, or as agnostics do, that maybe God will show up, perhaps, or as atheists do. Well, you know, who can tell the difference, right? Don't act thoughtlessly, but try to understand what the Lord really wants you to do. Don't be drunk on wine that leads to debauchery. We're using old King James. But I'm going to tell you, there's all kinds of wine. Wine comes in all kinds of flavors. It's not just red and white. Bitterness, anger, fear. All those things can be your soul motivators in your life. Things that intoxicate you, things that take over your thought process from the old earthly wisdom, all can become absolutely intoxicating. And you know, intoxicated people sing. Have you noticed? You drive by a bar, 
at night. You hear that, good night, Irene, good night, all that stuff, right? Yeah, they do sing. They sing and they make noise. They're noisy. Nobody wants to live next to a bar. Intoxicated people sing. Instead, instead, be intoxicated by the Spirit. And intoxicated people who are intoxicated by the Spirit sing. Except we don't sing songs that lead to debauchery or songs that lead to dissipation. Songs that you'll wake up with a hangover. We sing songs that praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And instead of taking away from us, they energize us. And they empower us to follow him. And drunk people sing. Spirit-filled people sing. And we share psalms and hymns and joy with each other. Have you noticed whenever you're, you're really troubled about something in your life and you put on a Christian CD or you start to sing? I notice my kids, you know, when they're in around exam time, you know, when they're stressed out, you know, Kyla will start to sing, you know, some chorus or something, a chorus will join in, and you got this whole kind of music thing going on, and you know they're stressed out. You know it's a difficult time for them, but they're singing, and they sing in the harmonies, and they do all that. All when they were little, they used to all sing different songs at the same time. That would drive me crazy. But what, I, what I'm saying is that there's many things we can become intoxicated with. Fear, anxiety, anger, like the like the gal from, from Bethlehem Church. But when she turned back to God, she was singing psalms and hymns and worship and saying, thank you, Jesus, that you love me so much. Thank you, Jesus, that we live in this broken, ruined, disgusting world, but you have rescued me from it. And you are in the process of rescuing me from it. And I don't have to live this way anymore. Then you shall sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in all your hearts. And you will always give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The fool says there's no God. But those of us who have received Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we make the choices to live in this world and engage the world as an expression of Christ. I wonder in my mind today, I don't think many of us are in the category of Christian atheists, maybe we are, but certainly some of us are in the process of it being Christian agnostics, that maybe we just say, well, we'll pray about it, and then we'll go fix it ourselves anyhow. But what if we took the lid off the problem? You get, you know what I'm saying? Like, what if we actually said, okay, Lord, I want to have Total Christian wisdom. I don't want to be tricked anymore. I don't want to be fooled. I'm giving you permission to engage me in such a way that I would live for you in ways that even I don't know yet. We don't get it all from the beginning. It takes a lifetime to develop a relationship with Christ. And then, even then, when we die, we still don't get it all. So be careful how you live. Not as fools, but as those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly church, but try to understand what the Lord really wants you to do. 
don't become intoxicated in, on wine in its various flavors, if it's fear or anger or greed or passions. Because in the end, they will just ruin your life because what does a man gain if you get all of that stuff and yet you still lose your soul? Instead, let the Holy Spirit intoxicate you. Let the Holy Spirit engage you in such a level that you get to know Christ in ways that you can't even possibly imagine today. Like my friend said, hey, I've been a Christian for a long time. Are we, all, are we supposed to get it all in the beginning? No, you're not. It, it comes to you in waves, in times, in changes, and, and you morph and you change into it as you make godly decisions. Then you will sing spiritual psalms and hymns and songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts. That's what Dr. Laban was saying in Christian community, what we had today. When we gather together, theres a, I don't know if you sensed it, but I sure did. When Jobina was leading us in worship, I could just feel the Holy Spirit just come on us. And whatever we, whatever we brought in here, we were, we, were, we were worshiping God in such a way that, that it transcended our own music. And I know that these worship people do not want you to, to hear the music, but they want you to experience the worship. And they battle with that all the time. We don't, we, we don't want to be musicians, but we want to, be, we want to sing those songs. Intoxicated people sing songs. But we want to sing the right songs because we're intoxicated by the right thing. And then you will always give thanks for everything to God. In the name of our Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much for blessing us. Giovanni, you can come up. That, Lord, we want the kind of wisdom that is not attached to this world. And, and when we are, are, are tempted to engage that kind of wisdom, we don't want to hedge our bets. Instead, we just want to trust you with the outcome. Holy Spirit of the living God, we desire to be intoxicated with you so that we can know and experience what God really wants us to do and the kind of people that he's really calling us to be, and the kind of church that he wants to mold us into. In Jesus' name, amen.